Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, today is a lecture for first year master's students, and this lecture is supposed to be in English, and this course on social network analysis is taught in English. And for today, we have a guest speaker. Uh, this is Timothy Pri, and he is an alumnus of our faculty, of our university. He uh, graduated from the University of Utrecht, and recently he got his PhD from Carlos de Soto University in Spain. And he has made uh, substantial research on social network analysis, and he's ready to share his experience. So please welcome. And if you have questions, uh, later we can discuss. You can ask questions in Ukrainian, and if you, you have problems with understanding, I think we can stop and make some explanations in Ukrainian. Sure. Alright, so thanks a lot for being here. It's a big pleasure to give a lecture at my own home base university. My name is Timothy and let me start saying, as Yuri explained, I'm not a native speaker, you are not native speakers, it's fine. So if I speak too quickly or if you don't understand what I say, just don't shy, raise your hand and ask a question. And it's alright to interrupt me at any point of my lecture. Okay, so today I'll be talking about two things. I'll be talking about social network analysis in sociology in very basic terms like what are networks, what is the basic language we use when we describe networks, some vocabulary. I'll talk about a difference between homophily and influence and then I'll present some case studies of our own research, which I have been doing with my colleague and, fri and friend, Dmitro Stavchuk, our studies of Ukrainian MPs. MP is a member of parliament, so deputate. Okay. So, what is network? Um, I don't know. Uh, can you guess where I made this photo? I can narrow down my question. I made this photo in Kiev, but uh, I wonder if you have any idea where did I spot this beautiful network? Pinchuk Art Center? Yes. It's a Pinchuk Art Center. It's an uh, art piece made by Bartolome Togo, an artist from Brazil. So, everyone, are, everyone is fascinated with networks. Networks today are everywhere. We could observe them in nature, in social life, in, uh, on internet, everywhere. So in, it's very natural that we would like to understand networks, their properties and how they work. And uh, very basic definitions of network analysis is that this is basically a single application of uh, what is called graph theory to patterns of connections between a set of objects. So what is graph theory? This is just a theory that comes from mathematics that helps us to understand, to quantify these objects and relations between them. So you could apply it in many different fields. You could apply graph theory to study biology, biological species, to study uh, cells, to study internet, but also to study human beings. So when we talk about human beings or groups of people, then we uh, study social networks. So what, basically, what are social networks? It's just uh, some sort of empirical phenomena that we observe. A group of people, let's say individuals, who are connected to each other. And that's it. A very simple definition. So when we apply social network analysis, we study these patterns of connections. Uh, okay, but I think it's very important to remember that we are all here sociologists. So it's very important for us to reflect on a connection between uh, network analysis and social theory. So why are we interested in it? And what kind of added value social network analysis can give us? Well, I'm sure you will study a lot about this soon. So you will study something about Zimmel, something about Tionis, um, Maranomo, all these people who uh, already told us something about individuals and to what extent individuals are embedded in social structures, something about groups, communities. This is a very big part of sociological knowledge. But I believe these three points are very important in the sort of in a contemporary sociology. 
So these three lines of debate, they really connect network analysis with sociology. And the first debate is a debate between positivism and constructivism. So I'm sure you all know about this debate. It's more philosophical, methodological one. That there are some people who believe that you know there is an objective reality, and in order to uh, study this reality, we formulate our hypothesis and then we test them against uh, data. And there are some other sociologists who believe you know that social life is constructed, and this means of social life could be constructed when we interact with each other and when a sociologist interacts with other people we sort of construct reality and we try to fix this reality and describe it well basically social network analysis is just a very handy tool to connect these two ideas because it's a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods we observe people who are in some sort of dynamics with each other people who generate meanings and connect to each other through ties and we can qualitatively understand these ties are they positive negative uh, where do they go with this communication and social network analysis gives us tool to understand this second debate is a debate between what is more important structure or agency so uh, have you attended classes by marina sabalevska yes, yes you know her good she wrote a very good book on that. Maybe you read her books on uh, Jeffrey Alexander, Luhmann, all other sociologists who tried to sort of answer, uh, provide their answers to this debate. So, in very simple terms, some years ago in sociology, a lot of us believed that social structure is important. That social structure constrains human behavior. So if we study structure, we will predict the outcomes of human behavior. Then other sociologists sort of added to this theory by saying that like, wait, we have agency. Human beings are vested with agency and together in system of collective behavior, people can actually change social structure. So in the contemporary sociology, we think about it in terms of triangle, you know, like the structure influences Individuals, individuals, they change structure. That's why we have this famous Coleman boat, because it looks like a boat, it comes from one, to below, back, uh, up. And again, social network analysis is just a very handy set of tools to quantify and to study these rela relationships. It has a very broad vocabulary. Like, what does it mean to be embedded in social structure? Does it mean that you're a member of a community or a group? Are you a central actor? Are you a broker? Things like that. So social network analysis just gives you sort of a broader perspective on this issue. And finally, social capital. So social capital is something which is, you know, very popular among Eastern European sociologists. I, I know that Ukrainian sociologists love uh, the idea of social capital a lot. I'm sure you all read a lot of books on social capital. So basically there are two big thoughts, like big lines of thought uh, to which social network analysis uh, contributes. So one understanding of social capital is that this is a common good. This is something that emerges from our communication. You know, like people, they come together, they communicate, perhaps they're satisfied with this communication, they like each other, and in the course of time, after many iterations <coughs> of this communication, let's say they start trusting each other. That's how social trust appears, and it becomes a common good. So we all can exploit this social trust in order to prosper, things like that. This idea is very much inspired by works of Putnam. I'm sure you all read Putnam. But there is another view on social capital, more sociological, more utilitarian. People like Granabetter, Hank Flapp, Lean. They believed in something else. They thought that social capital is like a resource, a resource that you can get from your ties. Like, I have a friend, my head of, also have a friend, has a friend, and this friend has some important information. And even though this third person is anonymous for me, and I don't know this person directly, indirectly, I can get this information, and I, I don't know, I can be better off on the labor market or something like that. This is also a part of social capital debate, and that's where social network analysis comes in. We can study these ties, connections of people direct and indirect.
indirect connection to each other. So, who can recognize this slide? This is a very familiar piece of software for many sociologists. I don't know if it's legible or not. It's just a table. Do you see what kind of table it is? What software? It is? Yes, it's SPSS. It's, uh, I'm sure you all love working with SPSS. <laughs> yeah. But this is a very traditional view on how we conduct our studies. You know, we have a huge data set with a lot of individuals. All these individuals, they're atomized, they're not connected to each other. And you just know, okay, we have a lot of people with, uh, like, without education. And then we have also a lot of people with education. And we can correlate the things with wages and uh, having a job. And we can conclude that, oh, people who have education, they have better jobs. This is not how we do studies in social network analysis. Because in social network analysis, we believe that people are connected to each other. It's not always important whether you have education. It's important whether your friends have education. So instead of studying thousands of in atomized individuals, we try to create data sets like that. People who are connected to each other and people who can share the resources or whatever they share through ties. And you can do a lot with social network analysis. You can study key actors, you can study uh, a type of relationships between people and strengths of these relationships. Uh, whether the communication is balanced or not, like I think that someone is my friend, but that person doesn't think the same about me. This is about structural balance. You can study communities, you can study evolution of these networks in time, you can study spread of rumors. If someone believes in, in a certain idea in one piece of network, how long is it going to take for this information to travel to another part of the network? All these things we can study. So you see that it's a very broad field because it starts with mathematics, with graph theory, but then we also add some sociological intuition to this, and then we make these fancy visualizations with some algorithms and computer software. So it's a bit of mathematics, a bit of sociology, a bit of computer science. It's on the edge of all of this. So that's why I find it very exciting because you know it's very inspirational to study all of these things simultaneously. Uh, now, some basic network vocabulary definitions. So what kind of words we use when we study uh, networks? Well, you know, what we, we, there are a lot of words that are different, but they describe the same thing. So if a mathematician says graph, a sociologist would say network. If a mathematician says vertex, we say node. When we would like to describe relationships, we say ties or links or edges. And there are different ways to visualize uh, networks depending on their properties because networks they have different sides or meaning different amount of people if you are talking about social network or it could be different amount of relationships between people then we talk about density of networks and that's how researchers analyze the data, we go back and forth from matrices to graphs. So, I don't know, if you saw this movie Matrix, uh, <laughs> yes, of course you did, there was a sort of a moment when the guy, he looks into a black, a dark screen with uh, green numbers and uh, letters, and he says like, yes, for you these are green numbers, but for me I see a woman, I see a man, I see a child. That's how we also work here, so you look at this matrix, but in fact what you see, you see a graph, you see a relationship between people. Uh, and, you know, if you look at this, into this matrix, you can make pretty educated guess uh, about everything that is going on there. So let's start just, for, a, for example, with the top left graph. If you see the matrix, uh, the matrix has only 0 and 1. It's a binary system. 0 means no relationship. One means there is a relationship between the two people. But if you look into this one, you have some numbers. One, four, zero. It means that we can quantify uh, a relationship. For instance, if I have a colleagues, and how often do I have lunch with my colleagues? Like with one guy, I have lunch four times per week. With another person, I drink only coffee once in a while. So from this, you can make a guess about how close are we with each other? 
uh, that one is called directed, meaning that there is a, some direction in our relationships. For instance, you can think about organizations, something with hierarchy. Like, I report to my boss, and my boss reports to another person, but they never report to me. So it goes only one way, but not another. And you can always quantify these types of relationships. Another very important thing when we think about networks is the notion of centrality. So intuitively, we always would like to know who is the most important object in this network. Like, if we take a certain person from a network, what is going to happen? Uh, is it going to break or not? And what does it mean to be important? So sometimes being important means to have a lot of connections, and we will call this uh, degree centrality. But sometimes being important means, like here, to connect different groups. So if we take this one object out of graph, the picture will change uh, completely. Even though this person may have fewer ties than others. And in this case, we will call this person uh, a broker, because a broker connects different clusters of people. Another important issue is a stru structural balance. Again, you know, a uh, friend of my foe is my friend or foe. Uh, if I like someone, does this person like me back? So there, there could be different configurations, and this is important to study with, uh, within the framework of social network analysis. And the final thing I, I'd like to encourage you to think about it when you think about networks is to think about them in terms of distributions. I'm not sure that you can see this. Maybe it's not really legible. Uh, can you see that pictures? Okay. So remember I said that, you know, different people, they might have different centrality. So I have a lot of connections. Some people have fewer connections. Some people have even more connections. So you can think about it in terms of distributions. So, and that's how you can analyze networks. For instance, in this case, what you can observe is that there are fewer people who have a lot of connections, and then more and more and more people who have fewer connections. This is a very typical distribution, which is frequently observed in the reality of social networks. Can you think about any example of uh, this law? of this distribution. Like when fewer people have a lot of connection and then many, many, many more people, they just have tiny number, few, a few connections in any real life example. Or maybe the theory of six uh, handshakes when you can imagine like you can get to any person you would like to yeah. by knowing like a person he knows another person and stuff like that. Six degrees of separation, yeah, but it, oh, it does not uh, qualify here because yeah. it means that on average we all have the same six connection. And I'm asking about uh, about the range when someone has a lot of connections but someone has few connections. Any social network, for example, Facebook. We any social network. We know people with a lot of connections, for example, Max Zuckerberg and so on, and we have people with one or two or three connections at all. Exactly. Like, think about Instagram. You know, it's very few people are top bloggers, they have an enormous amount of followers, and, well, there are other people who have like 20 or 10 friends who follow them out of pity. So, that's it. this is a very typical distribution. The university professors. University professors. For some professors, many students come to lectures, and for others, they just few students. Yes, yes. All these are real life examples, and they're very common. And uh, this power law distribution is something which is very frequently observed for networks. And if you know this distribution, then you can sort of uh, proceed with your studies, because now you can test hypotheses. You can see, you can test the hypothesis whether your particular network follow a certain distribution or not. That's how you do statistical analysis with networks. And the final thing that I'd like to address is the fundamental issue of uh, influence versus homophily. This is a very big uh, idea that has a lot of theoretical and methodological implications. So the best way to describe what is homophily is uh, by looking into this very old English proverb. Birds of a feather flock together. Basically, this means that people who are similar 
tend to hang out together. Uh, and this sounds very simple, but this actually it is a part of a very big fundamental question in sociology. Like, why do we make friends? Why do we cluster with some people but not with other people? And the usual answer, the mechanism, is because these people share some similarities with you. It could be similarities with social background, but also it could be a similarity with the way how you behave or the way you think about life. And it's not a very intuitive theory because there, are, there could be different explanations of why we sort of follow this pattern. There are some people that believe that uh, there is a sort of biological mechanism behind it uh, because let's say we're searching for uh, partners with whom to match. There are people who believe more in psychological mechanism behind it. So we have some sort of preferences. It's more comfortable for us to communicate with people who are similar. And there is also just a so social context. You know, imagine a country like the US. If you live in a very segregated area and you're white and you live in a neighborhood which is white, of course it's more likely that you're going to meet only white people in your school. So in this case, homophily is just a representation of a social context. And uh, that's why homophily is also a very big methodological challenge for people who study social networks. So for us, homophily is the same what is endogeneity for economists. So, because we could frequently assume that we observe influence, however, in fact, we observe homophily. And it's very difficult to disentangle these two. So when we think about influence, what, what do I mean when I say influence? Let's say a typical study of a job market. You observe a uh, few people who know each other, who went to the same university, and then you see that they attempt, let's say, the same job, they have the same job. So you sort of start to believe in that, oh, perhaps it is because of social capital, maybe they, you know, one friend invited another friend or something like that. But it is not necessarily the case. It could be just simply a case of homophily that people who share the same social attributes, they just happened to uh, have the same job, because what else uh, can they do? They don't have any other social trajectory for themselves. So it's not only enough to find that someone has a tie, it's also important to study whether a person actually exploits this tie or not. And this is a very big methodological issue. So with that, I think I will conclude with my first part of the lecture. Uh, I'll just... Uh, Sort of repeat the key issues that we study social networks, these are connections of people, we study ties uh, between these people, and uh, you know, we just always have to keep in mind whether we really, whether we could disentangle influence from halakha or not, because this is a key methodological issue. Okay, and with that, I'll just proceed with showing you some examples, so it's not just going to be a boring lecture. Uh, this is a research that I have been doing together with my friend for, for quite a while. And this is a research of uh, MPs, members of parliament, uh, our present parliament. So, and the question we are interested in uh, is, why do they collaborate with each other? And you can think about their collaboration in two terms. First, do they vote together? For a certain legislation or do they write this legislation together and why so naturally uh, social network analysis is one of the simples tool to use to study this uh, legislative process is a complicated beast it's a very nice citation uh, from one very smart guy Boom. but i think even this guy he has no idea what is happening in ukraine so there is another citation that I found in a magazine, Nova Vrena. This citation belongs to Parubi, who at the moment he was the head of uh, our parliament. So what he said is that any decision that is made in the parliament is built as a mosaic. Every day it is possible to have two or three different mosaics. And this is crazy, this is nuts, because usually you sort of think that you could anticipate what is 
going on in the parliament. You know, you have an opposition, you have a coalition, you have a party membership, so you expect MPs to vo vote with respect to the boundaries of their political parties. But in fact, we frequently observe that this is not true. They collaborate with each other somehow chaotically, or at least we think that this is chaotically because we don't know what is the pattern there. And that is what we are trying to address. We want to understand why do they collaborate with uh, each other based on some social traits that they share. Uh, this is just a simple uh, visualization of the parliament. Uh, you could simply um, attach any social attribute to party members. You could classify them by gender, by age, by former previous experience by political party, and you can make this fancy graph with them trying to uh, sort of trying to see what is happening. Uh, this is another tool that you could use, you know, how, how often do they collaborate with each other. This is sort of a matrix of correlation, whether members of particular party vote with each other or not. I'm not going uh, into details here, it's just a small demonstration of the fancy tools that you can use in your own research. You can also make different visualizations of that. This is the inflow and outflow of uh, voting together. Uh, but again, it's just a fancy thing. Oh, and this is more interesting. So this is a configuration of the parliament. You see different colors meaning different political parties. And these are different episodes in time. So at the very beginning, you see that very clearly that there is a cluster of uh, coalition and cluster of opposition, and they're very far away from each other. But with time, more and more ties emerge. So we see that with time, uh, members of coalition and opposition, they have started to generate a lot of ties with each other. And this is the question, like, why do they do this? And in classic literature on political thought, it's... Uh, well, this is a complicated question, because for many years, political scientists, they addressed this issue from a position of an atomized individual. So they believe that, okay, there is a member of parliament, and this person has his or her own motives or incentives to vote. Perhaps this person has to signal something to voters, or signal something to competitors, or to promote their own agenda. Things like that. But it's only very recently that political scientists have started to study the connections between these people and they understood that sometimes uh, the embeddedness into groups is also important. And why? Well, basically because the question here is why do they have preferences? And sometimes preferences, they come from social structure. So, and this is the key idea for us. Uh, and legislative process in this respect could be seen as just as one of many other examples of collaboration. So we observe collaboration everywhere. People collaborate in labs, people collaborate in the market, animals collaborate. So we could just apply those technical tools from social network analysis, which we tend to use when we study collaboration, to study members of parliament. And to study these two things, how they vote together and how they write legislation together. Uh, and this is not only interesting for us, because we are Ukrainians and because we like to study what our members of parliament are doing. It's also very important for the sociological literature. So there are at least two ways in which we can contribute to the literature by answering this question. So first, quite a lot of scholars who have studied this issue they always, almost always, study ties as independent variable. So they try to understand to what extent their ties, their connections, explain uh, other behavior of MPs. But what we are asking, we sort of flip this question around. We would like to understand the tie as dependent variable. Why does a tie occur? Uh, apparently not a lot of people ask this question before. And second, we just would like to provide sort of a new evidence from another country, which is not the US. Because this literature is huge for the US, but is very scarce for other parts of the world. A bit of, I don't know, a handful of studies on Europe, a handful of studies on Latin America, 
nothing for Eastern Europe. So we try to provide a new case here. And that's what we do. So first, data. And I highly advise you to visit this website. It's a project conducted by Vox Ukraine. I don't know if you... Have you ever heard about Vox Ukraine? Anyone? Yes, good. So it's a nice portal and they have a lot of data. Uh, these data are available for free and you could use it for your own research. So that's how the website looks. You have a list of data and you could download it. And that's how the data for uh, MPs look like. So you have a simple uh, Excel sheet, maybe comma-separated file, or I don't know. Um, you have names of MPs, and each column represents a certain legislation. And you know whether this MP voted for this legislation, or voted against this legislation, uh, etc., or was absent. And from this data, you can construct uh, your own data for social network analysis. So that's how it looks approximately. This is just my imaginary data in Excel. I'm sure you all uh, know how to use Excel. So basically, what, what you really want to do, you want to construct this kind of matrices. So when uh, MPs are connected with other MPs. So let's say if I collaborate with you 10 times, we have a number 10. If I collaborate with you zero times, we have number zero in this matrix. And then you create a lot of additional matrices to describe social attributes of these people. Let's say age. Perhaps we have a hypothesis that members of parliament of the same age are going to collaborate more frequently than at random. Uh, for instance, this, why do you think this could be a case, that people of the same age collaborate more frequently? Any guess? Maybe because, because they share the same views and uh, they rest in the same uh, society, so they have yeah. more confidence. Sure, age could be just a representation of uh, cohort, people from the same cohort, they may share the same values. Uh, on the other hand, you could say, like, okay, maybe age is, some, is not so pivotal for policy making. Maybe it's not only about age. So you start collecting data for all possible attributes you have occupation, previous experience, whether there were MPs before or not, whether they have Facebook profile or not. This is also in our data because, you know, it's important to know whether they're embedded in social networks or not. And then, how would you do it with the matrix format? You just take a, a distance between people. So let's say if my age is 30 and your age is 20, then the difference between us, between us 10 years. And you put it in the matrix. And then you just try to run all these multiple correlations and you try to figure out whether there is any pattern that people of the same age would collaborate more frequently or not. Um, and that's uh, what well, some of you will do uh, very soon, I guess, uh, in, the, in the course of your progress while working on social network analysis. I'm not going to speak about it in detail, but basically what you can do if you work with R, have you ever worked with R? Well, you will love it. It's a very simple tool with uh, very nice code. You can transform the data of, you know, just simple list of names and attributes. You can transform it into the format of matrices, matrices that would be very handy to handy for social network analysis. So basically, uh, the data that I just described to you could be transformed in something like that. So you can uh, start mapping connections between people. And then it may look even more fancier. So this is the image that a friend of mine, he did in another software, in Gephi. Have you ever heard about Gephi? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is an image of MPs who collaborated with each other at, at least five times. And you sort of start seeing some patterns. That there are some, you know, very huge dots, huge nodes, meaning that there are people who collaborate a lot. There are some small collaborators. You could see patterns of connections. But, you know, you could see very few.
few things just from this visualization. In order to test your hypothesis, you have to run statistical analysis by means of how I described it before, by running these correlations uh, across all the matrices you have. So, these correlations are called QAP correlations, and for covoting we have slightly different um, variables, that's why we apply slightly different methods, or less regressions. Okay, so, this are, so far this is a table of correlations. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, so I'll tell you how to... No, this is a regression. Okay, so, I like a likelihood of having a tie. So, a tie occurs between two MPs. If it's blue, then let's say it's not important. If it's red, then it is important. And you have a list of different attributes, like having a Facebook profile, age, single, uh, number of assistants, uh, previous occupation, uh, head of an informal group, majoritarian or not, uh, was an assistant before, new or old MP, uh, same committee, same fraction, same uh, coalition, things like that. So, the only thing which is significant here, both statistically and also meaningfully, only these things, this red and yellow, which is same faction and same coalition. A bit intuitive. However, this blue is for co-authoring with each other. This red is for co-voting uh, with each other. So meaning that if you belong, meaning that uh, faction and coalition, it doesn't matter for your uh, writing but it matters for your voting. So if I am a member of any political group, of any party, I can write a piece of legislation with anyone, even with my enemy. I will write it with a person from opposition, with a person from a coalition, with people from my own party, with people from other parties. It doesn't matter. But when it comes to voting, I will vote only for those uh, law that were written by people from my coalition and my party. That's it. And now I just summarized it that homophily is not important for co-authoring, but is important for co-voting. Which is pretty interesting, because in the previous literature, a lot of people uh, have treated these two as interchangeable. It's a very common practice to say something like, oh, we don't have data on co-authoring, so let's work only with co-voting, and then we will generalize our finding on everything else. But this is wrong. Apparently, these are very two uh, different practices. And then just, you know, that table was just the first step. We did also a bunch of other analysis, uh, looking deeper, that maybe sometimes for some members of parliament in some particular uh, period of time, uh, these variables could matter, and we just this is just a list of variables that were important in different configurations. That from time to time, even having a Facebook profile was important for voting. But again, I'm not going into detail now. I can share my paper with you uh, to talk about this in more detail later. So that's it. Uh, this is just a case study of showing how a tie occurs, to what extent different social traits matter for that, and how can you study it, going from, you know, downloading your data, putting it into Excel, opening it with R, and then running some statistical analysis. So if you master all these circles, you will be, you know, happy sociologist, uh, sustainable, doing your own study, your own research. So that's it. With that, I can show you just some references. I, I will share this uh, presentation with you guys, so you could uh, look into these references. And I'm done. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, so any questions, any clarifications, any curiosity questions, whatever. Criticism. <laughs> hey, Maffei, did you try to research outliers?
because if some workings do not follow your laws, the laws you found, uh, so there must be very interesting cases uh, related to corruption, for example. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to find something in our files? Well, the thing is, we didn't really find any outliers. So the pattern is that it's, it's like chaotic. If there is no collaboration for uh, co-writing, this is a very clear pattern of the absence of this uh, uh, collaboration. So, I, it's very difficult for me to say who is the outlier there and who is not the outlier. Because if one day a person from opposition block writes a legislation with someone from uh, Parashanka block and another day the same person doesn't do it, uh, and this is a general pattern for everyone, then I'm sort of, I'm kind of confused who is an outlier there and who is not the outlier. So, I would say that a very interesting, well, at least I sort of, I can speculate about it, that an interesting thing would be to test a particular period of times when uh, certain political parties announce that they're leaving coalition. Um, like, who left the coalition? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it could be considered as a sort of exogenous shock to, to this configuration, and to what extent their official declaration that we're out, to what extent this influenced uh, the dynamics or not. I would go to that direction, but... By the way, did you see Open Data portal of the Home Narada? Um, they, they published a lot of data sets it's working and co-authorship with a great history. Well, no, I have not. I, I'd like to see. I know that when we started this project, we started it several years ago, so there were not a lot of data at that moment. Yes, I, I know the history. Yeah. I will send you the yeah. That's very interesting. We also collaborated a bit with, um, with guys from Chesna because they collected their own data on assistance. And then at some moment of time, it became a part of this uh, law that I call it, uh, that anyone could write a request uh, and ask how many assistants MPs have or do not have. So we had our own data, Chestnut had their own data, and we tried to correlate. Yeah, it was pretty robust. Uh, you will be uh, amazed with the amount of data published by the Corona Okay, I, I'd like to be amazed, so I'll definitely check this. Thanks. You also can ask questions in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and I will answer in Ukraine. So may I have a statistical question? Sure. So when you run an analysis, statistical analysis for network data, and you run it like OLS regression, but you still have a problem of uh, violation of assumption of it depends. It, it, it depends on the dependent variable you have. So uh, we have two different data analysis here because we have two different data sets. So when we speak about co-authorship, uh, it's just a matrix. It's just a, you know a person uh, whether I co-authored with you or co-authored with you, things like that. And when we correlate one matrix with another one. It's a very different statistical uh, procedure. It's uh, not a, you know, like a common statistic that you have studied in the university. So you have no any assumptions about distributions. You have no p-values, nothing like that. So what you do instead, you run what is called um, bootstrapping, meaning that you uh, simulate uh, your data a lot. So you sort of imagine. What happened if your data? What would happen if your data were at random, at completely at random? You you take the same matrix and you just randomly put in zeros and ones, and you correlate this matrix with whatever matrix you you have, like uh, age matrix or gender matrix or whatever, and then you repeat this procedure many many times because at random you can have any configuration of ones and zeros. So we repeated our correlations 1,000 times, for instance. 
And then after doing this 1000 random correlations, you, also, you compare these results against your real empirical correlation. And if you see that your real empirical correlation sort of differs from that random correlations, then you make an assumption that, yes, uh, our statistical procedure sort of yields statistically significant results. So in this case, when you see that it is statistically significant on the level 0, uh, zero 5, it doesn't mean that this is a p-value. It means that, uh, in, that our real empirical correlation differs from these random uh, correlations in 95 cases out of 100. This is a very typical methodological tool and it is called QAP, QAP correlations. It's a quadratic assumption uh, procedure or something like that. But we also have another data with co-voting and this is a more sort of convenient data for you uh, because it's, it, had, it looks like that. If I voted out of, let's say, uh, how, to, how to formulate it. So we all vote for certain legislations. And let's say in, among all my votes, 65% time I vote the same as you vote. And, but I vote 20% times the same as you vote. And this is a scale. And because we have a scale, we could apply uh, normal regression analysis. So we see to what the increase of percentage of voting with respect to our independent variables. So basically you, you, you can play around with that. In, in social network analysis, your dependent or independent variables, they could be centrality. Uh, you can calculate the degree of centrality and then try to understand what are the predictors of centrality. And in this case, you run typical correlations or regressions. But for homophily, you run uh, matrices, correlations between them. Okay. Exciting, yes. You told us that we can compare statistically our distributions. Mm -hmm. But why do we care? How we can explain such results? Well, what do they mean if we find some statistical difference in uh, distributions? For example, uh, some distribution does not follow uh, uh, the power law or some law like. and so on. Yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, it's more like fundamental question because there are some people who work with this uh, network idea, and they believe that you know certain types of behavior, like social behavior, they universal, and that's and meaning that because they're universal, the distributions are also universal, and uh, let's say collaboration happens in the same way among animals who collaborate with each other. Uh, collaboration happens in the same way with uh, social animals like ants or maybe with uh, members of parliament or some business actors or countries uh, and basically when you test this idea it's just a, sort of an empirical argument uh, towards or against this theory so what we have here is a basic we already see that collaboration with voting and collaboration with writing are very different and this is already enough to say that this universal theory is wrong. So it's, it's a more an argument against uh, uh, some sort of abstract sociological theories. Okay, now homework. Great, I think uh, we're pretty much done here. So thank you for your attention, for your time. I hope you liked it and uh, I hope you will run some network analysis in the future. Thank you. Thank you.